The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Chapter 6. Motivation is overrated. Environment matters more. So in this chapter of Atomic Habits, we're going to be discussing, adding my commentary over how important it is when establishing habits to design an environment that works with you instead of against you, and how a destructive, counterintuitive environment can be so inefficient, ineffective to establishing new habits and managing and mitigating destructive ones, it is unbelievable. People often choose products not because of what they are, but because of where they are. Whether you pick up a piece of fresh fruit on a fruit platter, on the kitchen table, or pick up a fresh donut in the donut box in the same place, proximity matters. Your habits change depending on the room you're in and the cues you're around. So we have to ask ourselves then, yes, we might be looking for food in those examples, but that's the very general thing of what we're looking for. The what can come in a variety of different factors, and that can be dictated by where it's located. Out of sight, out of mind, in sight, in mind. Environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior. Behavior equals character disposition plus environment. So we have to also acknowledge that one's personality, one's proclivity towards certain character traits, openness, disagreeableness, conscientiousness, particularly the big five uh, that Jordan Peterson discusses and I've discussed in my summary of his book, 12 Rules for Life, if you're not aware of. We have to understand that your environment is often going to highlight and reveal your character disposition and just enhance it. So whatever character traits they are, if you're someone who tends to do or tends towards uh, aggressive behavior or violent behavior or uh, risk-taking behavior, your environment will exacerbate that or mitigate and manage that depending on the cues in that environment. So is your environment one that is very stimulating and promoting to the type of character that you want to be. If you want to be a more health conscious person, does your environment help you or hinder you? If you want to be a more in control emotionally, you want to be more a bit more dispassionate, a little, more, a little bit less emotionally detached to things in your life. Well, is your environment something that is constructed to that? Or do you have entertainment pieces everywhere? You have screens everywhere. You always have social media buzzing you. All your notifications are on. Um, you always got, you, maybe you live with a bunch of different people, which is very like stimulating. Have you ever tried living by yourself to create and change your environment? Like character plus environment equals behavior. Many of the actions we take day to day aren't shaped by personal drive and choice but by the most obvious option in our environment. So we want to hack and shape our environment to contain productive cues that provoke better, healthier decisions and interrupt patterns to make more conscious decisions. And so you don't have to be the victim of your environment. You can be the architect of it. You can be the mason, the architect, the designer. Imagine if you were trying to design your life as if it wasn't your own life, but it was someone else's. Maybe... You have a child or you're going to have a child one day. How would you just, if, if you had to decide, like you're going to design their environment so then they can be the most prosperous and successful. How would you design it for them? What about your best friend? Maybe your best friend's, best friend's going through some difficult times right now. How would you design an environment for them to be as healthy mentally and physically as possible and as productive as possible. Often when we step outside ourselves, we we direct the lives of others often better than our own. And this is seen so much in domesticated animals. I find it so interesting and revealing and uh, strange at the same time that people will treat their animals kinder not only then they treat other people but they'll treat them better than they treat themselves they will feed their animals better quality food Uh, they will give them the nurturing emotionally that better than they give themselves 
they will give them better, more consistent physical movement and activity. They'll design a better sleeping environment. They'll design like a better outdoor environment for them to for them to move and you know conduct normal animal behaviors. They will design an environment and a lifestyle much better for the animal they're taking care of. Often better than they take care of themselves. So, if we let's ask the question: What if you took care of your dog or your cat? as well as you took care of yourself? What if you took took care of yourself as well as you took care of your children or your best friend or your mother, father, grandfather? Just think of anybody in your life who you really try and take care of and nurture and, you know, be kind to whatever character traits are important to you. What if you treated yourself more like that? And it comes to designing an environment where you can be more successful at that. We design an environment for these other people and uh, pets in our lives. What if we design an environment for ourselves so we can be more successful? You see, it's extremely difficult to stick to positive habits in a negative, destructive environment. If you're trying to fight your environment every day, climbing an uphill battle, it's going to be a long, arduous road. Instead, if you change your environment or find a new environment that is more constructive and supportive to the person you want to be and the habits you want to create, you're going to start running downhill instead of uphill and momentum is going to be on your side. And so you're going to be able to get what you want, become who you want easier with less effort. I think there's this thing in life where it's like, oh, everything's got to be difficult. You've got to work really hard at everything. Why? I want to reduce the inertia. I want to reduce the resistance to motion. Why do I have to make everything difficult in my life? I do something physically, like most people do something physically uncomfortable. Well, actually, that's not true at all. I was going to say most people do something physically uncomfortable every day. That's me. That's, sorry, that's my value. But there is a small minority of population do that. Um, Most people have some type of discomfort in their life on a day-to-day basis. Uh, I was talking more... uh, physical in nature voluntarily Um, but it can be work related it can be family related it can be anything right and they run uphill and they make it really difficult and then and then when they create their habits they're like oh why don't i just do it naturally oh i don't want to have to make it easy for myself you know i should just be disciplined and regimented and motivated all the time why who says what your ego what your because that's the stereotypical admired trait in our society to just constantly keep working hard. What if you could work smarter? What if you could get motiv- momentum on your side and design an environment where now you don't have to exert as much willpower and decision-making and effort to do the thing you want to do? What if you just put the shoes next to your bed bef- uh, every morning um, bef- uh, in the night before so you can go for a run without having to uh, like exert some you know large amount of like uh, willpower and like effort cognitively what if it's just that's the cue enough to just get momentum in your side rather than having to exert just you know 30 percent more willpower and now you can use you know let's say there's a finite amount now you can use that energy that you would have spent here elsewhere in something where you can't be as efficient in so we have to direct our energy and our decision making and our effort when i say energy i mean effort like carefully like, like, imagine you got a hundred chips every day, and every every time you make a decision, is like chip, chip, gone, gone. You're losing the, you're losing like poker chips every time. And this is where destructive versus constructive environments come to play. So, how do you do it? How do you design your environment for success? So you have to understand that every habit is initiated by a cue. The cue stands out the most is what typically triggers the average person. Okay, what stands out the most? What can you visibly see and hear, smell and touch? Think about all your senses. It's easy to grab your phone every morning when it's sitting on your bedside table. It's easy to then look through social media when you open your phone, it's all these notifications and you've got all these like, it's like you open your home screen and it's like a, a bunch of different colored candy. Which one will I click on today? Now, how can you make that more difficult? Oh, the phone's off when I pick it up now. Uh, 
I have to exert effort and will, just that little bit of effort to turn it on. Then I have to wait 5, 10 seconds. I'm not going to sit here 5, 10 seconds. I'm going to go about my day now. Oh, yeah, I come back to the phone. Oh, yeah, something's here. Okay, what if you then next step? Phone's in the other room. You put it in a room that you know you don't go to. Maybe it's upstairs on the other end of the house. You put it in a room that you know you make it difficult for yourself. You work it into your day. It's like if you know that's a destructive habit, you design an environment to make the habit harder. If you want to make a habit a big part of your life, then you have to make that cue that initiates it a big part of your environment. The most persistent habits usually have multiple cues throughout their environment. Making better decisions is easier and more natural when the cues for better habits are right in front of you. And most people live in a world where others have created their environment for them and the decisions are governed by unconscious actions as they live off random or unhealthy environmental triggers and cues. So don't you want to be the designer of your world and your environment and not merely the passive consumer of it? Do you want to walk through life actively as an active participant or a passive observer? your choice and that choice is made in how we design our environment this is why i'm really obsessed like like with like designing an environment like like how your house and room looks people like perceive as like a superficial thing the furniture you have the type of whether you have a tv or not like your 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 office set up um your bedroom set up your bathroom set up your kitchen set up like a lot of people think that's whatever right it's just a kitchen it's just no it's not the room is your environment the room is your world. What room you're in now is is just like a construct of a mini world you've created amongst a bigger world. You look out the window, that's another little world, right? You have your, you might have a backyard. You might have just like a cityscape you look at, the ocean, um, really terrible looking decrepit neighborhood. Like, okay, maybe maybe hang some things on that on that window if it's really depressing to look out of every time, right? Because there are these worlds within worlds, and those worlds are your environment. Some people have really destructive environments that they're surrounded with, and they do everything they can to get out of them. Some people never understand the tools. They never learn the tools that this, the books, amazing books like this teach you, and people out there, professionals, help you through to learn to craft an environment that is a little bit better. Just a little bit better and more constructive for who you want to become and what you want to do in your life. And so the rooms are the worlds. So when you walk in a room, when you walk in an environment in your home that you spend so much time in, when you work in your walk in your office at work, what about your car? How much time do you spend in your car? That's a little world as well, okay? And we all have room to improve in improving the states of our world to make our state of mind and the things that we want to work on a little bit easier and a little bit better. And so it's much more than the superficial. It's literally who you're becoming and what you're doing and what cues in your environment trigger you. If you want to make a habit a big part of your life, then you have to make the cue that initiates it a big part of the environment. I'll repeat that again. And you often want multiple cues. So if you're struggling with a certain habit or you're struggling with a certain behavior that is destructive or you want to do something that is more constructive, you need to look specifically at the cues that are triggering you and work to make them difficult, hard to obtain, less obvious, far away from you less likely to cue and trigger. And the cues that, like the habits that you want to do, like you want to exercise more, you want to read more, put that book on, on, on the top of the bed before you sleep. So then, actually, you don't even do it before you sleep. You do it after you wake up, you put the book on the bed. Then the next time you're in the bed will be before you sleep, right? Most likely. So then you learn, you sit down on the bed. What's what's there? There's the book. Trigger. Q. You made it easy. You have to look at the book. It's on the pillow. There's no avoiding it. If you need more, what happens when you sit down on the bed? Your eyes face forward. What are you looking at? Whatever. A wall, a window, whatever it is. Second cue. Read. Little post-it note. 
on exactly where your eyes would fall if you were sitting on the back of your bed in the position that you would read. Because maybe you put the book to the side, you get distracted, you come back, you forget. Second cue, safety net, read. Bang. You could do that with everything. Any habit you want in your life. Q, 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 Q. Craving, response, reward. Bang. Context is the cue. We mentally assign our habits to the locations to which they occur. People usually drink way more in social environments outside of the home than they do in the home. People usually train harder when they're working out and competing against others, especially if someone they admire or want to impress is observing or they're working with. So maybe you're not getting your training sessions done as effectively as you could. Maybe a training partner would help tremendously in improving the efficiency and performance of and quality of those sessions. Maybe, you, maybe you're really struggling with which is attention and like of staying focused when you're reading or studying or working on a project. Maybe if you worked with a project partner or someone on your team or someone who had a similar like-minded interest to you, suddenly learning becomes this fun, engaging exchange of ideas where you can bounce off each other and not just be strictly structurally reading, writing, exam, essay, like unengaging and monotonous. It can be this beautiful exchange of intellectual ideas at a very cerebral, uh, active level. And we have to understand each location establishes a connection to certain routines and behaviors. This location I'm in, it, like it's associated. I don't, I, I don't sit down here unless I, I don't do any. I don't do leisure work here, right? This this is a office. I sit down. I work. I might do a variety of different tasks. I do different businesses and different uh, tasks that I that I do when I sit down here. One of them being this. But this location is associated. I know. I'm. Re, I'm I step in this room. All right. Time to get to work. I step in another room. All right. That's time to sleep. I don't do anything else in my bedroom except sleep. People eat in their bedroom, watch TV just in their bedrooms. Some people live in really small environments, right? Like I understand that not everybody uh, can afford or has the luxury. Uh, you know, they got a phone and that's how they're watching this video in one room and that's it. That's their environment, right? It's a one bedroom apartment. You live in a New York City. It's a shoebox. Okay. It's fine. You make corners of, the, you, you have a room, right? So that means you have corners. So you make each corner designated to certain, you work out in one corner, you, you, you read and study in one corner, so you learn in one corner, you go to the bathroom in one corner, and you cook, clean, and do kitchen work in another corner. Like I'm just giving an example. Like, okay, now we can make a mini environment within each partition of the room. Because I recognize that a lot of people aren't going to have multiple even rooms. Like for some people, having like multiple rooms, like some people's home is as big as the room I'm I'm sitting in. Like, I'm grateful as hell for the opportunities and what I've created in my life, right? But let's talk to everybody. Let's talk to the people like living on the street. I know a lot of people living on the street actually have phones and get internet connections. And maybe some of you are watching this. Okay. You're sleeping outside. And this might sound, I'm not, this is not a hyperbole at all. This is like, all right, you're sleeping on the street. All right, you got to get up out of there. You got to find some way to design a better environment to get up out of there. How are you going to feel a little bit better so you can st summon up a little more discipline and just a fraction more motivation just to get up and do something a little more positive for yourself and get to the, speak to the person you need to speak to, get to the home you need to go to. Book the appointment you need to book. Well, Maybe instead of sleeping on the street, on a busy road, you move yourself to the nearest, closest homeless shelter you can find. Maybe you now start building community around people who are disadvantaged, just like yourself. And I even struggle with it. This is really like a difficult one. It's a really difficult one. So the example I'm giving is not maybe too useful, but... Like, just think about it. You got time, right? Think about it. This is why changing your environment, such as your living situation, is a fresh, great opportunity to establish a whole host of new cues and thus better habits. So, 
if you're moving into a new environment, like I've recently done, this is a new brand new opportunity to like redesign your habits. Actually, my routine has changed. Like my, my morning practice has changed because of, partly because of this new environment I'm in. And that when you move to a new place, when you travel to a new country, travel to a new city, notice the habits that you once exhibited mostly <laughs> disappear. Unless you have to, tr- you need something mentally to trigger yourself to do them because your environment's way different. Just an observation. Notice it when you travel, when you go to an Airbnb or you go to a hotel or uh, you go to someone else's house to stay over. It's like, oh, this is a new environment. Oh, wait, didn't I do that in the morning or the night? Shit, nothing to trigger me now. But that can be an opportunity as well to realize whether something's still constructive to you is going to a new environment and see how you do without it. Do you actually need to do your gratitude practice or your journaling or your, your meditation every single morning? Is it actually resourceful to you to still do it after all these years? Try it without it for, for a couple of days in a new environment. And see how you feel. In your home, you want to design rooms and areas that are associated with different habits. You know, work, entertainment, sleep. Yeah, right? So you're not, the point was we're not watching TV in the room or sleeping. You don't want to associate stimulation with down regulation. I'm not going to study in the room I, I, I work out in. I'm not going to associate like focus and calm cognitive uh, attention with high stimulation physical activity. The associations we make are very, very important because when you think about music, certain music, the, I think it's a great example, certain music triggers certain feelings and emotions. That is a great example of how rooms and environments trigger certain behaviors. Some music makes you cry and emotional. Some people make some music makes you hype and ecstatic and happy and, and, and energetic and it gets your heart rate up. Some environments do the same. So we're not going to muddle around the context and habits together. Otherwise, some habits will falter and they won't be executed. And so even in very small environments like your tablet, your phone, your laptop can be associated with different types of behaviors. One could be for work, one could be for social media, one could be for writing. Your desk could be for writing, your table could be for eating, your chair could be, could be for relaxing. A prison cell can be divided into four corners, one for workouts, one for bathroom, one for sleep, one to learn and meditate. If you want behaviors that are stable and predictable, you need an environment that is stable and predictable. Where everything has its place and a purpose. That is a place where environments, envi- that is a place where habits can thrive and grow in. I'm going to read that one more time because not because I messed up, but because it's, it's important. Re- repetition.
So that is chapter six, motivation is overrated, environment matters more. Next video, chapter seven, the secret to self-control. We will be talking about, for those who don't know, I have summarized and analyzed and added commentary on many books, 12 Rules for Life, every single chapter, 48 Laws of Power, All 48 Laws by Robert Greene, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, and now, Tommy Cabot's by James Clear, and should be going on right now if it's not already finished, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari, A Brief History of Humankind. I pick books that are particularly impactful and profound. Instead of reading hundreds or thousands of books, I just go deep and try to understand the fundamentals uh, to them instead of having a superficial tertiary understanding. I hope it is valuable. I do this selfishly mainly for me. And then now it's at a point that, well, I don't know, just share it. There's other people who could take value. So if you want to improve the world around you, prove yourself. That's what I do. If you take value from these and you want to see more, I recommend, because YouTube won't let you know always, hit the notifications on that YouTube little bell icon below. Or you can listen on all podcast platforms if you just want to listen to it while you're on the go. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all at Alexander Emanuel if you guys want to stay up to date on what I'm thinking and putting out into the world. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.